Welcome to today's conversation, Adaptation, the Transformation from Page to Screen, as part of WIF's Vote for Women TV Summit. My name is Courtney Lavarge bell and I'm Director of Development for WIF. We are so pleased and honored to welcome um, today's panel. We have Camila Forbes, Executive Producer and Director of Between the World and Me, Liz Garbus, Executive Producer and Director of I'll Be Gone in the Dark, Misha Green, creator, executive producer, writer, and director of Lovecraft Country. And our moderator today is the wonderful Janelle Riley, deputy awards and features editor at Variety for today's conversation. Um, Janelle, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. I am so thrilled to be here today. And whenever I have people as accomplished as you are, I, I actually like to go back to the beginning. I usually like to ask, what was your first job in this industry? Like, did you begin as a PA? Were you on sets? Were you in the mailroom? Um, you, you all do so much. I guess, what was the first thing that you felt you could call yourself a filmmaker, call yourself a writer? Where, where did it all begin? And let's start with Misha. My first job, it's a, sometimes hard to job script. I'm sold to script. That's a job, I guess. But my first job, job in TV was on Sons of Anarchy. Um, really? The second season. Right out of the gate, you were on a hit show. That's impressive. Yeah, it was actually my favorite new show of the season. It, it had debuted it the year before. And so I was just a kid in the candy shop. I was so happy. That's amazing. Liz, what about for you? Um, well, this is going to really date me, but um, I was a PA on Carlito's Way, um, the Brian De Palma film. Um, I was, you know, locking up the streets. Um, and uh, yeah, that was my introduction to Life on Set. That's a pretty great one, though. I mean, that's Al Pacino, Sean Penn, Brian yeah. De Palma. That's it that was, Yeah, it was pretty exciting. I mean, even if we were just blocking traffic, it was it was pretty exciting to be part of it. Camila, what about for you? So my first job, I had interviewed to be um, an assistant to Stanley Finn at the time. And at the time he was, um, and I didn't get the job and was like, oh my God, why can't I make this man's coffee? But um, he called me later um, because I'd been doing a lot of work in sort of the hip hop and spoken word community. And they were just streaming up um, uh, the Deaf Poetry Jam series. Um, so my first job was actually as a, um, I ended up being a talent producer on that show um, and then a producer and then continued on with the, with the franchise as it spun off. So, yeah. I mean, this, this question is hopefully designed to show that everyone comes from humble beginnings, but out of the gate, all three of you were doing pretty well, actually. <laughs> That's really impressive and, and refreshing, honestly. Um, so you all pulled off tricky adaptations of really great source material. Um, I'm curious for each of you, what attracted you to your book or the project initially? How did you first come across this story? And let's let's start with Liz and I'll be gone in the dark. I came across this story um, when HBO sent me the galleys of the book, I'll be gone in the dark. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work in the criminal justice system and what, you know, sometimes is called true crime. Um, although that seems to, it, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting moniker that, that covers things, which I think um, it shouldn't necessarily. So I'm, I'm fairly skeptical um, in general of, um, you know, doing a film about a serial killer. It wasn't something I was necessarily looking for, but when I read the book, um, what I realized was it was this extraordinary voice um, and Michelle McNamara, and that if we were going to make a series based on this book, it was going to be guided by that voice. Now, as people who know the series um, know she, or know the book know, she was had died prior to finishing the book. And um, like for her co-authors, this, this documentary series became sort of a labor of love and following in her footsteps, um, reconstructing this journal, this journey she had to identify um, the, you know, the greatest predator in California history, or the most uh, uh, prolific, I should say. And, um, but well, for me, it was about this voice, this voice of a mother, um, a wife, um, a, an extraordinary writer who had found some frustration in her career, and it had found her calling here. And how was she balancing all of those things? Um, and of course, her struggles with addiction and all of that became um, the spine of our series. 
Did you know anything about Michelle? Had you ever heard the name or did you know Patton Oswald, her husband, or even, you know, the Golden State Killer? Did you know any of these things? Um, no, no, and no. I mean, no, I had seen Patton Oswald. Um, I had seen some of his work. Um, I did not know anything about Michelle. And then, but then after starting the project, I realized I found out we had friends in common which was really incredible. And it was about three friends in common and really good friends. So I do feel like I, I know her and I really um, wish I actually had known her. Um, but I didn't know anything about the Golden State Killer. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an East Coaster born and bred. So it wasn't in my you know, daily appetite of news that I, that I would get over the years um, or my daily uh, you know, meal of news. Um, but um, you know, what I found in, in Michelle was just a, a great avatar um, of an incredible storyteller seeking to humanize survivors and um, you know, search for that needle in a haystack. And Camila, I probably like everyone else, you are familiar with Tana Hesse Coates' book, um, but also because I, you go way back with him, don't you? That's right. Yeah, we went to college together. Um, so um, yeah, was very familiar with his work because <laughs> I knew him when he just started writing as a poet. Um, and um, so yeah, I, I came across the book um, in 2015. Um, and, and, and it was a personal journey to me um, because, you know, this was letters to his son um, and ta and I came up together. I'm godmother to his son, Samari. So hearing this story of um, how, what does it mean and teaching a young black boy lessons about what does it mean to grow up in a world in which in the age of Trayvon Martin was something that was very personal to me. And more importantly, the book centered around um, the murder of Prince Carmen Jones, which also was our um, college classmate who was murdered in 1999 by Prince George's County Police. So my, my, my urgency to tell this story was one that was um, very personal. Um, and also um, I, my background is in theater as a director. So um, I initially set out um, and adapted the book for the stage. Um, as a stage production that ran in 2018 uh, at the Apollo Theater and then also at the Kennedy Center as well. Um, you know, because I was interested in having a communal experience, understanding that our world and our community was in dire need of healing and transformation and having a, pace, a place to, um, you know, where, where do we rest this trauma? Where do we deal with this trauma, um, this PTSD that we're basically walking around with? Uh, and so in a communal setting felt the most appropriate. So, and for that, for that, that was theater for me. Um, the work was supposed to tour um, in 2020 and 2021. And unfortunately due to the pandemic, um, it halted the plans of touring and, um, and also in 2020, uh, Breonna Taylor and uh, the George Floyd case um, uh, you know, rose to national and international prominence. And it felt like once again, that there was an urgency to tell the story now. We obviously couldn't tell it through theater. Um, so what, we, what the next best um, in that time period was to make a film. Um, so that was really the journey from book to stage to film. I'm curious, um, do you think of the, um, the film adaptation as kind of an adaptation of the stage work as well or purely of the book? So um, I would say of the stage work um, because uh, the stage work really allowed us, um, uh, it was really exploring this idea of taking sort of a one man's voice and, 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 and transforming that into every man and woman's voice, right? Um, and, and hence taking the book and breaking it down into several monologues. Um, and some of those monologues may have been almost like sort of stock characters and figures and then casting towards that. That's what we did for the stage work and, and play, um, as well as trying to heighten the natural poetry that was written in the language. Um, and we did that through you know, projections, visuals and music in the stage version and really try to also obviously lean into, you know, lean into the tools that you have in the toolbox as film, um, which, which just took it a step further, but definitely the stage work was definitely the, the basis and foundation um, that, that really helped us jump off into the adaptation for film. I really wanted to see the stage production. Is there any chance it might come back? We hope it might. We hope it might. Now that theaters are opening again and 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 the world is opening back up again, so we, we hope that it will um, we were able to remount it again. Because there's nothing like a live stage experience, sitting next to people, experiencing language and stories and characters all at once. And Misha, um, 
you have such an interesting task because Lovecraft Country, out of these three adaptations, it feels so strange to say this, but it might be considered the most traditional um, because it's based on a book. And, that, you know, there's nothing traditional about Lovecraft Country is the funny thing. Um, was it a challenge to sell this story that shows, you know, the literal and figurative monsters of the 1950s? And and how did you first come across this story? I, I'm like embarrassed I'd never heard of it because H.P. Lovecraft and this genre are like of such interest to me. It was not hard to sell. Uh, CAA actually sent the book to me and Jordan Hill and they were like, you should meet Jordan. He's, and I was like, I don't like to laugh. Why should I meet Jordan? That's just weird. He's like, no, he's really into horror. He's working on a horror film right now. You guys should meet. And so we met and we vibed right away and we loved, you know, we loved the same things about genre. We had the same favorite movies. And then he was like, come watch my movie. And I was like, you know, you, you, when you meet someone, you creatively vibe, you're like, oh no, and now I have to see the art and what if it doesn't add up to our creative vibe and all that stuff. And then of course that movie was Get Out. So it definitely vibes. So that was the start of it. And once we decided to do the project together and then JJ came on board, it was that hard to sell. Everybody, Get Out had just come out. So everybody was like, yeah, we'll take it. We'll do it, we'll do it. And it was just about finding the right home for it. I mean, I, I, I'm, I've been trying to think of anything you could point to previous to Lovecraft Country as an example. And part of the joy is that I don't know that you can. Um, that's one of the things I love about it. But I guess obviously with names like that attached, you didn't you know, have to go in and give the 20 second elevator pitch. Um, yeah, I mean, we gave the 20, I literally gave a 20 second elevator pitch. I think the end of it was, and then we'll do a bunch of cool stuff, guys. Um, <laughs> but then you sell the project and everybody has in their mind, get out. And so then you have to go, no, we're doing, this is a reclamation of genre, all genre, all pulp genre. So it's not just going to be horror. And then people start to go, whoa, wait a minute. Like what, so every episode's a different thing. I'm like, yes, but there's an overarch. So you do end up having to sell it even once you've sold it because everyone has one thing in their head and you're like, but we're going to do something totally bananas and crazy and insane. And here we go. And they're like, Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because the series is based on Matt Ruff's book, which itself draws from the stories of H.P. Lovecraft and the world of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, when adapting a novel for screen, I mean, where do you even begin? Do you highlight your favorite parts or moments, or is it more about using the book as sort of a jumping off point for your story? Yeah, I, I use the book as a jumping off point. I, I don't think anything's sacred. I think that there are two different mediums. A book is not a TV show and a TV show is not a film. So you have to do something different every time for me. Um, and to me, I just, I read the book and the things that sit with me, that's when I go, okay, absolutely cannot lose those things no matter what. And then you go, I go back through and I go, okay, now what's great? What can we pull from? Because that's the thing too. And like, it's so great. It's why I love history. It's like, you, can, you can't make this shit up. It's like fiction that you go back and you're like, what? There were sundown towns? If I just pitched that horror movie of like, you can't be in this town after dark if you're black, people would be like, okay, that's a little heavy. We don't know if we buy it. And they're like, they're all over the country guys. It's right there in history. So I think for me, when I adapt, don't hold anything sacred, build upon it and take everything that's dope with you. And Liz, you had kind of an interesting challenge in, in adapting because you're bringing Michelle's book to life, but you're also telling her story. Um, I have not read her book. Everyone tells me I should, but I get scared easily, even though I love horror, weirdly. <laughs> but how did you sort of make the decision to balance the story in the book and then her own life and, and really tragic death. Well, Patton um, gave us the most wonderful gift, which was he turned over everything um, from Michelle's study to my production. I mean, from, you know, we, we were able to recreate her bookshelf, the shape of her desk. It was a custom made desk that he had made for her. Um, you know, the toys, it was a converted playroom um, slash office. And, and, you know, we created, you know, with the same toys and photos um, and literally, you know, her hard drive and phone, um, he gave this to us. So we were able to, you know, chart minute by minute her thoughts through her emails, through her texts. And um, also, of course, from through her, her book, um, you know, which gave us the sort of larger uh, overarching narrative. 
Um, she also had videos and audio recordings of her interviewing survivors and police officers. Um, so it was this incredible excavation of a woman's life um, cut short. Um, you know, the portrait of an artist as a young mother. I mean, it was everything. She had so much going on. Her life was so full. Um, and through those recordings, which range from baby videos to interviews with, you know, people hunting serial killers, we were able to have her voice be very present in the film, feel like you were on the journey along with her. And then whenever we, we wanted to get big and literary, we went back to the, her incredible prose. And we were able to make connections between, you know, the kind of grittiness of this investigation with big ideas about life and how, you know, how we're all sort of, you know, connected by this thin string of, of, of cause and effect. And, 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 you know, she, and so we were able to kind of bring in that, that 30,000 foot view along with this kind of gritty investigation and the fullness of a woman's life. Um, so it was really income. And then of course, you know, as Misha says, we build on it. Like we're going out, we're doing our own interviews, we're interviewing people she didn't talk to. So, but we're building this whole world, but we're using, you know, the, the pavement she left for us. Mm -hmm. And you're obviously working so closely with Pat Oswalt, who, you know, wasn't just her husband was her collaborator in many ways, uh, you know, in, in getting the book out there after she passed it, it, and like the scenes with him are just heartbreaking. Um, was it sort of HBO who put you two together? Or, or I guess what I'm asking is he clearly has so much trust in you. How did you go about earning that trust? I don't know. I mean, it was HBO that put us together and um, he uh, took an incredible leap of faith. I mean, I guess he had watched work that I had done and it's never exploitative. And, you know, um, of course there was a lot of sensitive information on her phones and on her hard drive. And she was a woman struggling with addiction and that was happening under his nose. Um, and, and, and he didn't know, you know, the half of it. So, you know, that th there's so much vulnerability there. Um, but in doing what he did, he did an extraordinary thing to other families. I mean, you know, addiction to painkillers and, um, sleeping pills, it's so common and his openness about it and his willingness to look at himself and say like, how did I not know um, is so, I think, you know, it's just so good for other families to see that and be able to ask those questions and see his vulnerability. And I think at the end of the day, this, this series, it, it's about a serial killer, it's about a woman, but it's also just about talking. It's about like the survivors who, who were raped and, you know, bound by this by this GSK who were told by their parents when they were 16, 17 years old, don't tell anyone this happened, right? And Michelle's own trauma and her addiction and self-medication, she didn't talk about it. And so at the end of the day, it's about those secrets we keep, which become cancers. Um, and I think we all have them and we all have them in our families. Um, I don't know even what your question was, but there I went, so. <laughs> and actually, I'm I, all there with you. Right? I know. <laughs> yeah, damn. Mm. We, got, we all have it, you know. We all know someone who's, who, and and you know, we're only as sick as the secrets we keep. I think at the end of the day is what unites all these stories. I think making documentary films, especially something like this, you know, in, in addition to gaining trust, are, are there ever times where uh, you know? Uh, how do you have that line of like respect for your subject, but also, you know, there might be things you need to push on. Was Patton completely open about everything or, you know, did you have to have some discussions? We had to have some discussions and I, and I'm not speaking out of school. I'm sorry. There's a very loud uh, helicopter out there, but um, no, we had to have some discussions. I mean, he, you know, there was no way to tell this story and not talk about Michelle's turmoil and inner anguish. And um, I think when he gave us the book and he gave us, it was in his head because he's a widow and he's suffering. Um, it's about this hunt for the serial killer, right? Then that serial killer gets caught. And like, it's all about that. And then when I would come back and interview him and ask him questions about their relationship, I think, you know, little by little began to dawn on him that of course I was interested in this woman at the center. I mean, I always said I was. And, you know, there were definitely times where he's like, do we have to go there again, Liz? Like, haven't I answered that question? Um, and I would, you know, we would talk in the next room and I would say like, we can't, can't keep this down. Like that's exactly what this show is about, right? It's about being able to share this stuff so it doesn't kill us. And um, and he was so on board 
but um, it was not easy. You know, I don't know if I could do it just having suffered a loss like that. And uh, Camila, uh, knowing uh, Ta-Nehisi, Ta-Nehisi, sorry, <laughs> was he involved at all in this adaptation? Did you want, did you want him to be? Um, and what is it like when you're working with a friend? Yeah, I mean, you know, he was, um, and he was in the way, I mean, I think the, the beauty I think about working with um, a friend who's also an artist is, and, and who respects boundaries of artists is that he was very clear that, you know, I wrote the book um, the book, that's mine. That's what I'm precious to. These, the film, you go, um, you go and 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 go and interpret um, and 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 do what you what you need to do with it. Um, what he also, you know, he did review and and as we were going along, and it was great to sort of get his feedback on, um, you know, in the process of the filmmaking as well. Um, but yeah, you know, also because it's your friend, you also you know you don't want to mess it up, right? You don't want him to look at it and say, "Oh my God, what did you do to my book?" Um, and, and, and thank God, you know, that, that hasn't happened and that didn't happen with that, with the film. So, um, you know, I, I sweat, I can, I can, you know, crisis averted, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's always there, you know, cause you don't want to let people down. Um, but at the same time, you know, so, but it was also free to have that freedom to mm -hmm. just go. Um, I assume you probably probably had conversations about including Breonna Taylor's story since since his book was published in 2015. Was that his idea, your idea, kind of a mutual decision? It was, it was a little bit of a mutual. So at the time when we started filming, um, we started this production. The thought of even it came up in July of 2020. We started we went into production at the end of the month uh, of July um, and we're shooting through August. Um, of last summer. And during that time, specifically in July, he had begun um, uh, editing the Vanity Fair issue, um, the September issue of Vanity Fair, which um, uh, featured, um, the, the feature story was on Breonna Taylor. Um, and he was interviewing Breonna Taylor's mother. And I, I remember and he came back um, from the interview and he was just sharing his early stage writings. And I, I literally was like, oh my God, how, how can we use that? We have to you know, figure out a way to use that because you know, obviously, yes, this book was written in 2015 and it's talking about Michael Brown. It's also talking about Prince Carmen Jones, 1999, but here we are in 2020. This becomes a real sort of real contemporary linkage. Um, although we knew it in the public sphere, but it was a really tangible way to bring it into the film. I, I mean, I know things that, things have to change for every medium, obviously. You can't just, you know, make a, completely true to the book adaptation when you're bringing something to the, sc the screen. Um, I'm curious about some of the more interesting either plot or aesthetic choices you might have made in translating your stories to the screen. And obviously Misha, I'd love to start with you because you're adapting a, a fiction book. What's, what changed? Lots of things changed. We added storylines, we added characters, you know, we added music, we had all those things, VFX. I think that we added more monsters. We definitely went to, um, you know, Matt had wrote the book as the idea, his first idea was to make a TV show. And so it was really? set up in a way where each chapter was its own thing. And I wanted to keep that going. So we created our own, every episode had its own vibe and we added some vibes. Like there wasn't the adventure story, there wasn't the Korean War story. So we added all of that. Like I said, I, I don't feel sacred to the thing. I'm like, let's go, let's, the heart of what Matt was doing was this idea of reclaiming genre space that typically has left people of color out. And I was like, that's what this show is, is that's what this series is. and there's plenty of genre to go into. So that was just the mandate. And then we built from there. And when you said earlier that, you know, you, you don't like to laugh. <laughs> Have you been a fan of, of the genre space for a long time? Yeah, I've been a horror fan since I was a kid. It's my favorite genre. I love it. My first spec that I sold was a horror spec. So wow. I, I, I basically was again a kid in the candy shop. I was like, this is what genre is what I've loved forever. And to be able to put people who look like me in it, I always have to imagine myself. But then I started to think, I was like, do I love horror? Because it's not people like me really dying. It's really a bunch of white people running around getting tortured, um, which is interesting once you, once you slip into that genre yourself. 
Liz and uh, Camila, for you, your you you know your your works are based on true stories, real people. Is it different? Do you feel as free taking some license with things, or maybe you didn't take any license at all? I I totally did because again, this book was written from a father to a son, and we had. Um, it was important to represent, you know, multiple identities and um, women um, and um, trans women and um, mothers and aunties and uncles, right? So it was really the, op the, the exercise was really an opportunity is how do we, you know, build a community, um, you know, while using his words um, supplanted on other, on, on other bodies, on other people, um, but these actors also as themselves, as members of a community, not as playing character. Um, so that was that was to me. I think it was really sort of interesting and exciting, and and walks walked a really fine line of you know is it is it narrative is it doc what 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 are we actually doing here? And I, I like the gray area, um, um, you know. And 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 for me, it was it, you know it was also a mission of um, really showcasing you know a, n not the horror and the trauma. But how do we have the flip side of the joy and the healing and the resiliency um, was 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 really a big part of you know there there's several lines within within the book that I that I resonate with right um, the idea of the beautiful struggle um, of how do we how do, how do we really uplift that um, because you know we've been so traumatized in 2020 and continue to be um, the hope is that this film becomes not just a, a deeper dive into that trauma but more so an opportunity to uplift mm -hmm. and to heal and and to celebrate and enjoy Liz what about for you uh, you mean how how religiously do we adhere to the text is that is that the question yeah which, which I know is an unusual question in your case because it's not just about the book but yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, her story stopped um, and, you know, the writing of the book stopped and there were friends and her husband who, who picked up and finished that for her. And I saw us as an extension of that, you know, moving it forward into the future, um, you know, cherishing all the archival, you know, breadcrumbs she had left for us. Um, and, but then also the story was changing before our eyes. So we were also open to that. And, um, you know, uh, it was wonderful to have Pat in there and, you know, because Michelle was our North star and, and he was embodying her and having his love and approval of the project felt like we were doing right by her. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you know, Camila and Misha said, you know, there's no sacred words that you can't move around when we pulled excerpts from books from letters we mixed and matched you know it's all in service of the story and you need to know your truth like the truth of your work and when what you're changing is in service of that truth you know you feel okay with that um i guess it's a bit of arrogance um required but it's also just uh you know a, a check-in with yourself and knowing what your what the truth of your story is that you're trying to convey and Camila, you just mentioned, um, I guess, I guess your cast, um, this amazing group of people that you got to be involved um, in Between the World and Me, from Mahershala Ali. I to saw them at the Apollo. <laughs> you? I'm so yeah. jealous. I, yeah, yeah, it was, it was incredible. Yeah, she had. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, how did you go about? asking people to be involved or were there some people who reached out to you and I mean I think obviously everybody's read the book so you know that in and of itself is probably the biggest selling point. So there were people who were involved in our theatrical cast so folks like Angela Bassett, um, Joe Morton, um, uh, there were several yeah so several of the folks Mark Bamuti Joseph that had already kind of been engaging in the work as a live stage production and then as we you know moved into the film um, we widened the net um, and, you know, it was it was actually, you know, we could get more voices involved because it wasn't a physical production. Um, and quite frankly, we were shooting in August of 2020 when there wasn't much work at all happening. And so people were home. Um, so, uh, you know, we got a lot of guesses and, and a lot of people also wanted to say something right there was a really politically charged time and and how do we how do we get involved how do we how do we what's our artistic response and or reaction and so this was that that opportunity as well so i think that was also a you know one of the other factors that um really sort of unlocked for people but yeah a lot of times it was a lot of sort of you know personal calls um 
to folks, um, some who we knew, and then there are definitely folks who I, I think were, were new to us in the production, um, you know, like MJ Rodriguez, who was fantastic. Um, and But it was really exciting, you know, to have her part of it. You know, I mean, speaking of casts, we have to talk about Lovecraft Country because this is just the most amazing actors from top to bottom, you know, Michael K. Williams and Jonathan May. I mean, I, I could go on and on. Um, I'm curious, where did you even start with putting together this amazing ensemble? And you have such great actors. Did they change how you saw the roles at all? No, you start on the page. You just try to create somebody real and then you wait for that person to walk into the audition room. And I feel like with Journey, I'd worked with her on Underground so she can kill anything. So that was an easy, that one was easy. And then Jonathan just walked into that room and he embodied all the layers of Atticus. He was the geeky boy. He was the guy who went to war, who was angry. It was all of that wrapped into one. And I feel like everyone kind of did that. Like Michael K, Courtney, Anjanu, Abby Lee, Wumi, like everybody just showed up as the character. So it was quite easy on my part because I just went that one. Yay, you did all the work for me. Um, and then we got on set and it was just that kismet thing where you're just like, it's going too well. This is going too well. What's going to happen? Not everybody's just killing it. Every time you put them in the frame because we shot with all these wide lenses, I'm just like, I want to stare at your faces all day and that's great because then you do have to do that mm -hmm. Camila you you mentioned you know shooting during the pandemic I'm, I'm curious for each of you how much the COVID-19 shutdown affected your production Camila for you you did the entire thing yeah we started production end of July and our show aired November of 2020 our film aired November 2020 so it was all during lockdown and and at a time when you know um COVID protocols was were like a, a completely new term. Um, and so and, and so it was challenging. But I think that, you know, a lot of the challenges um, posed for opportunities and obstacles, you know, for sort of creative opportunities to solve for. So, um, you know, I knew we could I couldn't shoot a great deal of, you know, um, coverage with my actors, except for, you know, really capturing um, the monologue itself. So then had to rely on other forms like um, archival. Um, and, 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 and then the archival that we use, we, I really wanted to see archival that had, we'd never seen before black people throughout time. Um, so we leaned on home videos, like, you know, handmade home videos of black families in the fifties and the sixties, um, so that the gaze was consistent, right? So that who was behind the camera and what they were capturing, um, it was black families capturing each other. Um, we found TikTok videos, videos online that, that really kind of helped to build this patchwork quilt. Um, you know, and that was to solve a, an issue because we couldn't shoot as much coverage and also leaned into animation as well um, and worked with a really brilliant animator, Molly Crabapple, um, that built some beautiful structures. One of my favorite scenes is with Oprah and, and the animation that she built over that, um, which I thought was just so incredible and, and, and powerful. Um, but again, these were all solves for issues that, um, that COVID-19 posed. You know, we shot in five different cities um, and, and all of which I could not travel to because there were travel restrictions and quarantine restrictions when you were leaving out of state. So that required a great deal of remote shooting. Um, because we shot in New York, DC, Atlanta, um, LA, and San Francisco. So, you know, in some, in some cities I was remote, um, zooming in and, 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 and relying on uh, my DP's eyes and, you know, turn the camera on, I wanna see what's in the room. I gotta see what else is there, you know? Like it was a lot of that, um, but, you know, and a lot of us leaning into sort of innovation, um, whether high tech or low tech innovation to get it done. Mm. I mean, they say necessity is the mother of all invention. Are, are there things you learned during this process you think you might take into your next work? Yeah, you know, what was really interesting is that, I mean, um, you know, uh, you know I, I know I, I, I did, had to do a lot of Zoom reading um, and table reads, um, almost relying on almost a lot of the work that we do in theater, um, where we sit at the table and do table work for a while, right? Um, and because I knew that literally because of COVID-19, we just did not have the time when we had on with on set um, because I mean, it, we literally just did not, right? So, um, so we, I leaned a lot on that and, and um, but that was really effective because the second we came in, uh, everyone felt comfortable and they were comfortable because they were also, some of them were in their own homes. Um, and, and then we dropped in and, and, uh, and off to the races. So there was a lot of that that I thought was really helpful and useful to the process. 
Liz, what about for you? I'm, I'm not sure where the pandemic shutdown fell in your timeline. Oh, it was perfect. Um, we we uh, are, we were we aired in June of 2020, um, and so we were finishing. We were in post um, and still finishing some of the later episodes. Actually, in the offline when the pandemic hit. So, um, like you said, Janelle, necessity is a mother of invention. There were you know great innovations in terms of being able to like you know beam into an edit you know to to move edit rooms remote and then have us be able to you know. Evercast was the platform where we were able to, um, you know, c comment and work with our editors remotely. Um, you know, doing a sound mix and color correct remotely is definitely not ideal. Um, it's super time consuming and it's just not as good. Um, so when you say like, what do you want to take with you? I don't want to take any of that. Um, I like not having to fly to LA for meetings. I like that people are comfortable <laughs> doing Zoom meetings now. That's the good part. Um, but no, I mean, it was, it was definitely a struggle. And we, we, we made a um, bonus episode, which is airing next week um, during the pandemic. And like Camila said, there was a lot of beaming into homes and working with local amazing DPs who could, you know, be there when we couldn't, were our eyes and ears. So it's doable, but, but you lose, you know, you do lose um, the, that personal interaction. And of course, um, uh, you know, and certainly in post, it's a it's a it's a cumbersome process. I actually want to I want to come back to the special and ask you. Oh, well, I'll just ask you now. <laughs> How did that sort of come to be? Was it a matter of leftover footage or people wanting to know more about the story? Or we, you know, the the the, the special brings our viewers up to date on what happened with Joseph D'Angelo when he sentenced. Um, and of course, you could just read that in a newspaper, but really what it updates us on is how our survivors participated in that and how they went through the judicial process to see this, this guy ending up um, finally brought to justice decades and decades after these crimes. But um, largely the motivation was an unsolved case, which was um, uh, Michelle's origin story, which is in her book, uh, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, about an unsolved murder of a girl down the street from her, um, Kathy Lombardo, who was coming home one day and, and was killed. And that when, when Michelle was 16, and that gave her the itch, the itch to you know, put broken pieces together um, and try to make them whole. And then also learning that they'll never be whole again. Um, but, uh, and, you know, we kept on trying to work it into the main series, into the, into the regular show. And it just was ex too expansive. It was, it was, it was too full a story to kind of be a detour. Um, so we just held on to it. We, we shot more of that story and that became the special. And uh, Misha, uh, you had 10 episodes that premiered in August. Where were you? At? I'm, I'm hoping you had shot everything by the time the pandemic hit. Yes, we had finished like a week before the pandemic hit okay. and we were in post, which was on such a massive show was not ideal at all. Um, but I, I, I was a quarantine person. I was like, I'm not going anywhere. So actually HBO had to build a mini like mixed stage and an apartment across the hall from me because I was like, I'm not leaving. So either you're not gonna get this show or else we're, um, but it was, it was remote. We did it, it was crazy because also the VFX on our show are so extensive that having to go through every single one of those shots um, remotely was not fun, but we had an amazing production team, post-production team, and they came together, they put the plan together. And since I was a little hypochondriac, we had actually started before the lockdown because I was like, something's about to happen. This is about to happen, guys. I don't know what's going on, um, but it was good. We did it and I'm so, I look at the show and I just know what everybody was going through at the time. That was one of the things I was like, guys, we have to slow down. Like we've made up this date to premiere this show. Like we don't actually have to premiere that day. We need to slow down. And we ended up going back to 14 hour days and posts, but it was still that thing of like, wow, we did this while there was a global pandemic and everybody was in quarantine and everybody is still safe. Yeah. Mentally, I don't know, but physically that, that was something that was very important to me to not put the work above everyone's lives. And I don't think you were a hypochondriac. I think you were ahead of the curve, honestly. I'm a little bit of a hypochondriac. 
<laughs> um, sort of, a, 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 this is a broad question, but how did it work? Would they send you passes and you would just have to be a lot of back and forth and conversations over Zoom? Yeah, I mean, we also have Kevin Blank is an amazing, he's our VFX supervisor. So the team he had put together was prepared to tackle it. And it was just, it, it had to be a lot of trust. It's like, a, you know, this is the biggest VFX show I've done and you learn a lot and how important and how creative that role is. Like, it's not just someone who's doing, you know, paperwork. Like, he was talking to, because we had vendors in London, in India, like, all over the world, massive, like, this was a massive project, and he kept it all together. And creatively, he had to speak to those people on a daily basis. And so it was about us being on the same page, and then him going off, and then me seeing the fifth version of the thing and not necessarily the first version of it. And they'd be like, okay, let's tweak it there. And cause there was just no way to do it any other way than that. There was, you know, usually you sit in a room and you look at the screen and the, all the monitors are calibrated. It's perfect to see every detail. And it's like, you can't do that when you're looking at it over zoom. So, and I'm that person that's like, wait, is his leg right? I need his leg to be right. So it was, it was very much having to have that, that team and that communication open and going back and forth. Um, again, kind of a broad question, but for each of you, what ended up being the most challenging moment on your project? If it was something in, in the inception of it, well, in the actual production, sometimes it's in post, sometimes it's just like trying to crack a story beat. And uh, whoever knows off the top of their head can go first. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think one of the toughest was probably our timeline. Um, we, um, and, and, and part of the urgency is that we wanted the film to come out, um, prior to the election, um, which was November 6th. Um, and, and so it, it was a really truncated timeline, which, um, you know, there were some days we were shooting in literally because of remote, we, we could shoot in three different cities, um, where I was on site in New York and, and remote then in LA and then Atlanta later on that day. Um, but it was very you know, it was it was a very in, in, incredible matrix, labyrinth, if you will, of just a schedule where we were in pre-production and post all at the same time. There were moments when that happened, and at times could be a bit schizophrenic. Um, but I would say that the, the 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 timeline was probably the most challenging. But at the same time, the timeline is what was fueling and and truly the engine behind the film is at, at the same time. And Misha, for you. Production. I think we had we were six months, six, seven months of shooting. And I mean, it was a lot. We were trying to do a different genre every episode. So it was nothing was really the same. You couldn't block shoot really because we were doing different episodes and different times. And then the emotional weight of that all the actors had to go through. It's like that that's a heavy toll to do for eight months straight. And Liz, for you? So there were a lot of challenges. Um, and I think, well, there are two things. I'd say for my team, um, there was a lot of pain <laughs> because we were dealing with images that were extremely disturbing. And we were dealing with a, a the life of a, of a woman who had um, overdosed and um, confronting and she was kind of driven to it, confronting those same images <laughs> that they were then scanning and feeding to our edit rooms. And, and so there was like a lot of, we all talked a lot. We all said like therapy, you know, let's go like, you know, take time. Um, that was, that was something like taking care of the team um, was, became extremely important um on a project like this where there was so much violent uh, material they had to sit through and also of course developing a style i mean i'd say the biggest challenge and the biggest joy of the show was also developing a style that was was survivor focused and um where we kind of turned the like serial killer we tried to turn the serial killer genre on its head and have it be you know to deprioritize his point of view so you know we shot all these scripted um uh you know on location reenactments is a terrible word i'm going to use it for time but it was about flipping the script on what point of view it was never that killer coming in on that woman asleep in the bed it was always her point of view 
her experience, what did she see when this, you know, when this was happening to her and developing that style was both a challenge and also, a, you know, a, a joy. It was a great challenge. Uh, well, again, um, these are all such great stories, such great works of art. I want to thank you so, so much for being here today. I want to thank everyone for watching at home. And again, congratulations on, on really some stunning accomplishments.